Have you been scrolling through many, many, many film podcasts thinking there's far too many of these? Or have you been thinking there's something missing? There's something we're not quite getting. A waffler from Northern England reviewing films, for example. Welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. No politics, no pandering, no point. Uh, I'm here today with, um, I'm really excited about this one. I'm here today with um, L.A. Beatles from Unsinkable, the Titanic podcast. And we're going to be talking about uh, Titanic, Untold Stories, the Discovery Channel documentary from 1998. So I'll let my guest introduce herself. Hi. Yes, thank you for having me. This is actually my first guest on, guest spot, so to speak, on another podcast. So I'm super excited to be here. And if anybody who has listened to some of my podcasts knows, I have a huge interest in film history and film reviewing. I've even sort of hijacked my own <laughs> podcast feed with quite a few movie reviews over the past couple of months. And so anyone who already follows me knows I'm headed in that direction a little bit myself. So it's really exciting to be here. And I love to talk about Titanic. So here we go. It's great. Thanks yeah. for having me. No, it's fine. Um, I, I very much, mine's the opposite. So mine's like film reviews and then, it, it was either this or Titanic. I had friends say to me, why don't you do it? And I said, well, no, there's too many. Like, not that there's too many, but how would I bring an extra? I didn't want to turn something that I loved into something that would become a bit of a, not a chore, but I didn't want it to become something that was like, what do I? And I thought about something that was like a really, an A to Z, so somebody who knew nothing about it. And in the end, I went for films. But you could still see remnants of the Titanic stuff, because when you go back to my reviews, I am steadily doing pretty much every Titanic film I think there's ever been yeah done. I saw that um, I've, <laughs> absolutely I've still, yeah I've still got the 1953 one to do um and I've but I did look at the ITV series that they did 2012 and I'm also looking for a copy of Titanic Blood and Steel the American um oh series yeah did. I haven't I haven't watched that one yet I received a I've gotten a couple of messages from my listeners about that one it's a big time commitment and I have small kids so I have to be careful about what I commit to when it's a series yeah. Um, and then my whole, my whole family just, I mean, my whole family is already just walking around my children walk around my house saying Titanic this or Titanic that. So it's <laughs> the sickness that's already in my household. So I just, I have to be careful about not also committing my husband to watching, you know, 12 hours of something, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so no, it's, I, I noticed that in your feed, you've already covered a lot, but if you, the 53 is one is a good one to hang on to and, and do yeah, something fun with I've that one is a trip. Yeah, I've got the DVD yeah. copy down there. But yeah, that one more from kind of a point of view of how kind of old fashioned it is. Um, and they try and make it this kind of romantic anyway. Because uh, I, I started watching it and wasn't in the mood for it, which is unusual for me. But I think I binged too many Titanic films all in one go. Oh, I, I feel yeah, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you need a bit of a break. But um, yes, yeah, so we're looking at the Discovery Channel documentary that you've got the companion book to which I need to find out where you got that. I need to find my own copy of that one. I'd love to read it. And um, the reason why I picked this um, is because I got this book when I, uh, not the book, I got the VHS, the video of this when I was about six or seven, maybe uh, brand new. And it came in a big bumper pack and you got like two replica newspapers. It's somewhere. I don't know if I've still got it or if it's been lost in time, but I, um, cool. I've, and then I, when you buy the box set, somebody got me it for secret Santa at work, I think. And it had this documentary and I was like, Oh my God, it's, that's the documentary that I remember. Um, so I've still got it um, on DVD, thankfully. But yeah, so um, it, we start off and this is the, I think I couldn't figure out, you, you, you probably know, because I know when I looked at the I From Air website, so that's the, for people who don't know, and I wasn't too sure, I couldn't remember. It's the French Institute for Research and Exploration of the Sea. So they were the guys who, with Wood, Woods Hall Institute, uh, discover the Titanic wreck in 1985 mm -hmm. um, whilst they were secretly doing a US government mission trying to find the USS Thresher Cold. and the Scorpion. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, I couldn't figure out, and this um, is where I think LA can help me with the. I, I couldn't figure out because I looked at the IFMA website, which is all in French, but thankfully you translate. Yeah. And it said after 1987, there were expeditions in 93, 94, 96, and 98, um, which were carried out under contract with the RMS Titanic American Company, RMS Inc., I think. Um, RMS Titanic Inc., yeah. yeah. So I couldn't figure out which one this which one this was. I'm not, I don't think it was 1998 because that was the big piece. But I, you... Yeah, that was, that was the big piece. Um, I think that it's, 
I, let me see if I can. I actually have, like I mentioned to you, I have notes on the companion book that it's funny. We were talking before we started that I ha just accidentally happened upon a few months ago. Um, I don't have, gosh, I didn't write the date down on this. I, it obviously couldn't be 98. I'm thinking maybe it's, is it 93? Would it have think, gone back that far? Possibly. I think, I think it's either 94 or 96. Because oh, oh, you said 96 or 94, 96. Yeah. I'm not sure if I had to guess based on the date of the publication of the book and this documentary, I would guess 96. Yeah. Um, but but basically, whenever I start a new documentary or a new film, the first thing I have to do just because I, I have the very unique problem of this is what I read about all day long, which like you were saying earlier is a blessing and a curse. It is. But uh, I have to drop myself down into the timeline of where this is in terms of the Cameron film and the Ballard discovery. Those are always the two big ones in my mind if I want to get a handle on what moment in the cultural history something is kind of landing in. And so for this one, when I saw that it was done by discovery, number one, my brain immediately goes to this book I had just read. So I knew it was connected with Charles Haas, Jack Eaton, um, and this French team, because there is there's so there's basically two camps that come out of the 1985 discovery. And I'll give you listeners the very, very quick rundown. If you're interested in the longer picture, I do have an episode on Bob Ballard. Uh, but basically, Titanic is discovered in 1985, not just by Robert Ballard, but by uh, him and uh, John Louis Michel, who is the head of I for, the I for Mir team. They go out together. Actually, they have two completely different ships. There's the um, the French ship, the Notil, is the first sort of stage of the mission. And they're the ones kind of combing the area, trying to find it. And initially, Robert Ballard was supposed to just come in with his technology and essentially take photos. And so the the joint kind of venture that these two teams had planned for 85 was the French were going to use their sonar to find it. And then Bob Ballard was going to take pictures. But they ended up on the American ship at the end of the mission. The French had not located it. Bob Ballard ends up locating it with his sonar on his ship. But John Louis Michel from I for Mir is on the Nor, which is the ship that Bob Ballard is 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 in charge of. So the French are very much co-finders of the wreck, which doesn't get mentioned as much or enough. Their technology was a huge part of the you know discovery of the wreck of Titanic. So Bob Ballard and John Louis Michel are are friends. They work together a lot. Jean Louis Michel actually came to Woods Hole, which was the obviously the organization that Robert Ballard worked with uh, in the United States. He came there and worked for a year before they did this. So they're working together in, you know, in a work environment. So the falling out that they have, I've never been able to find enough sources on the French side to figure out from John Louis Michel's perspective. But the best that anybody can gather is that there was an argument when they get back after the discovery to the East Coast, they pull into Woods Hole and these photos that they've taken of the wreck it's national and global news. And apparently Woods Hole releases the photos to the US media before the French media can get their hands on them. And so there's apparently just a, a huge crevice that develops between them at this point that they're never able to get over. I think there's probably way more to the story, but long story short, what happens then is that you have I for Mir, Jean-Louis Michel, this French, a sub uh, called, what's the sub called? The ship is no teal. What's the sub? Is it? Um... Uh, it is the Argo or is that the year after? Is that 90? No, um, Argo is, that's Ballard. Ah, yeah. yeah, so that's... Argo is when is is with Titanic with that original expedition. What yeah. is their so, sub so called? Just to, Let me see what, what, whilst you search for that, just to um, go back to something that you were saying, yeah, that makes sense with Bob Ballard. The original idea that the French would find it and then Ballard would come and photograph it fits perfectly with what we've just found out in the last few years of, oh, it turns out that it was part of this Cold War, almost something out of a film, you know, something out of a novel that, that basically the US government, uh, whoever part of, part of it was, that said, look, go find these two destroyers. And if you've got any time left over, you can go and try and find the Titanic. But it was, you know, he'd done all the research 
Um, so that it, they had this perfect cover story of, oh, well, I want to go and find this ship. Yeah, no problem. So the idea that the French would find it or the French team would find it and then the Americans would rock up and kind of, not that I'm um, no doubt there was loads of different nationalities, but the Americans would then rock up and go, right, okay, we'll take the photos of it. But just, it's interesting that, that it could have gone both ways. If the planet had gone off, it, it would probably would have been fine. But because you have this strange, make this strange kind of situation where the French go, well, look, we haven't found it. And then Ballard turns up and they find it. In because I gather oh, completely, they, yeah. There's. No, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, completely no, alternative, a completely alternative timeline. If they find the wreck of Titanic when they're on the French ship, and I was wrong, the No Teal is the sub, so ah. that's not the ship, that's the sub. But when they, if they find Titanic when they're on the I Vermeer ship, then then everything about the cultural history of the finding of the wreck of Titanic is 100% different. Yeah. And Robert Ballard doesn't become the cultural icon in the same way that he does. But at least that's my personal yeah. opinion, for I sure. Mean, and yeah. also you've got that, not to go too far off an alternative history, um, but if, if the ship, of, it wouldn't have made sense, but if the wreck was closer to France and they went to, back to France first and they had the foot, because obviously you've got a, for now you think, well, why would the Americans release it before the French? Well, if you go back to the technology and I'm not a massive tech person but i'd know enough to know that it wasn't the same as now you couldn't just like this technology probably didn't exist so you couldn't just fire over you know live photos or live videos or over mm -hmm. to the french or over to france sorry and have them because if it happened now so say me and you discovered something they would probably do a, a telecast or whatever you call it simultaneously in england uk and in america at the same time yeah like we get with you know mm -hmm. premieres of not to bring it back to films or tvs but like you do with you know game of thrones that they premiere at like 2 a.m in the morning here and pre well they used to and uh, then they premiere yeah. at the I same didn't actually time. didn't know that okay well, yeah they used to anyway but uh so they do that yeah. so that you can't be it can't be spoilt for you, if you especially with the way the internet is now but um, yeah oh yeah now they would just now the feed would just if it happened now the feed would just come in and it would go out, like you're saying, simultaneously to every media organization in the world with the click of a button. And so that is a, it, that's a good point. That's just a, a sort of <laughs> exposing how different yeah. or how far technology has come just in this short time. But, um, but yeah, so just, just to finish the very quick summary. So essentially you have this wreck finding moment in 85. And after that, Bob Ballard goes back, but he goes back without the French. And he goes back with a very close relationship that forms with National Geographic. So any National Geographic documentaries that you see about the wreck of Titanic, those are those are associated with Robert Ballard, Ballard mostly. And those tend to be associated with this idea that the artifact should stay on the ocean floor, yes. should not be brought up. And Ballard is very much in that camp. So you can sort of think of it as you know, American ship, Ballard, National Geographic. Yeah. Then you've got Ive Vermeer in their French ship who doesn't team up with after 85 with Ballard anymore. And they start taking private money from this group of investors, US investors called RMS Titanic. So obviously that brings up a lot of questions of relationship between science and private capital. I don't think we have time for that discussion in this sure. podcast. But, you, but, but can you yeah. have the, I mean, the argument would be, if we were going to go into but we won't. But the argument might be, well, you can't do a lot of the research you'd want to without private money. That would be an argument that, mm -hmm. that I would, oh, yeah, that's the sure. argument I'd go down. And if we ever want to go through that, we can. But um, I've got I've got an idea of when it is. I don't think it's 1996, 1998 um, expeditions, only because after, um, in the 96, 98, they had an ROV robot vehicle called Robin, which you don't see in this documentary. Because apparently it, oh, it went okay. off. I and mean, that's just my guess. Um, and it was just talking about uh, Ballard and his opinion, just to break it down for people who, I mean, I think your knowledge is above mine. Um, but it, it definitely. Oh, no, you know, so I can, I mean, I think we know about the same level on, on this stuff. So it's we a great back and look forth. At, yeah. uh, look at different things. But I, I know it, just for people who aren't massively aware of the Titanic and its story uh, and Bob Ballard's um, opinion, you know, he says that these. Uh, uh, so I for Mayor come across with this idea that these this archaeologically significant uh, these significant objects should be taken out of debris field um, at the start because the technology wasn't there to take it out of the ship. Their argument was to do that for future generations. They've brought up over four thousand objects and it's probably still counting. Uh, I think they've gone out of business now actually. Um, whereas Ballard says, you know, when I find things now, I don't give out the coordinates 
anymore. He says, why destroy the pyramids for context? I think later, because I watched um, Save the Titanic with Bob Ballard, that's a great documentary. Mm-hmm. If you want to see his good and National yeah. Geographic's opinion, um, he says something along the lines of what it's like. It's his opinion of Ifremer's expeditions, although he doesn't name them, is he says it's like taking a lot of tractors and plowing up the Gettysburg battlefield, which for any UK viewers, even though it's in France, that's kind of like saying you'll plow tractors over the Somme even though the Somme's in France, it's yeah. like a cultural thing for, for, mm-hmm. for Britain. So that's the, just for people who don't know a lot about American history, um, I know the Battle of Gettysburg was quite culturally significant. Uh, so that that's where he comes from, uh, where Ballard comes from, whereas the French are very much from this side of, you know, we, we need to bring this stuff up because this, but whereas Ballard and, the, and a lot of families and survivors come from the side of, well, that's a graveyard and should be left, which... I, I get the, I, I mean, I I used to think I sat in the middle, but I personally think having seen artifacts of, of uh, like I went to the Imperial War Museum North, which is in Manchester, and they've got um, some beams from the World Trade Centre and they're all crooked. And I saw people taking uh, photos yeah. and I was like, I didn't take any photos of it because I thought it, it's not, a, it was just a feeling. I thought it's not appropriate. Similar to when I went to um, the Czech Republic and did some, um, kind of tours of uh, Theresian stat terrors in the, the Prague's kind of uh, ghetto, even though it's outside of Prague, and with with the Holocaust and everything. And I thought there was a there was a, a guy going around in front of me with, you know, a big camera that you'd see it like a, a football, mm. uh, well, football or, or soccer or, or American football, you know, the big lenses. And I thought you're not looking at anything, you're not understanding. You know, take, look at it and read it. Why do you need to take a photograph? Mm. So I think personally, it it should probably be left. But at the same time, there's a, also a little part of me that goes, well, I don't know. It, it's just, it's a, it's it's a, strange, a hard it? call. It's, I've been developing an episode on this question for a long time, and I don't even know when it will be because it's so much information. But one of Robert Ballard's big arguments, and I see the, the merit of this one, one of his big ones is we're not going to learn anything by bringing the Titanic pieces or artifacts up because the Olympic was an identical ship and we have all of the pieces of the Olympic. We have her interiors, we have the China, we have, you know, furniture, we have. So that is one argument I have heard him say that I agree with. My counter to that would be that the artifacts that people are more interested in bringing up are people's personal effects not the China. I mean, I know people collect the China. I'm more, you know, I'm more intrigued by it, you know, a a briefcase that's brought up. I can see both sides. I mean, I can see the side of, you know, family members who were given artifacts from their family member that died on Titanic that were brought up from the floor. Maybe they're the great grandson of someone and now they have their locket that was born or, or that they wore on Titanic and it has a baby picture of their mother in it or something. You know, there are these beautiful stories you hear where families are reunited with these very personal artifacts. So I'm I'm one of those people, I don't yeah. know where I fall it's strange, with it. Isn't it? I'm, I'm, it's really hard to say. And, and watching this documentary, I thought a lot about it yeah. because whenever you get into the mix with this like Ballard and Nat Geo side, and then the more Discovery has mm-hmm. tended to do these documentaries more with I Vermeer and with historians like Haas and Eaton's that seem very okay with, this work with the artifacts yeah but they so, still seem to have that reverence for what they're bringing up they bring up one of the absolutely. telegraphs don't yeah. it, in this documentary and they seem to have that reverence for it but i think it's it's interesting that you mention um about that idea of personal objects because i think that was one of the arguments right at the beginning because i don't think i mean i might be wrong but i don't think ballad was completely well, no, not Ballard, but I don't think that the whole Titanic community was completely against things being brought up. I think there was an argument very early on that's been lost in the ether, which was, I don't think we should, we can bring up things that don't have a personal connection. We shouldn't bring up shoes and this, kind, this that and the other, but we can bring mm-hmm. up plates. But then you got the, you had survivors and family members who said, well, actually, uh, what if that was the last plate that my father ate off on my son? So then you get into that, well, really, mm-hmm. but, but, then there's a part of um, the argument that it's because the microphone's good. I wouldn't mind otherwise. Um, I know. I was about to say, I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I've had to, my cat, it's usually my cat. I'll be recording and then I'll realize that the cat's in the room. 
she's she might be in here right now sometimes she hides I haven't heard her yet but uh I have to edit out a lot I have, to, I have a really good like white noise reduction too but it's hard it I mean I think people understand that you're never going to get every no, sound out so not. yeah um yeah so so you've got the two opposing sides and I think one of the you've got an emotional aspect to these and the, I think there was a documentary with James Cameron who I think falls into ballads um oh I'm not sure you might be able to correct me i think he falls more on the ballad um, side of things of leave it alone but then i've seen mm-hmm. him on documentaries where they've talked about objects they've brought up so there's have you seen the clip in the national geographic documentary where they talk about they found a, a, a leather satchel and it had women's perfumes in it and yeah and, and it was all how emotional mm-hmm. really emotional that the uh conservat- conserve conservative what's the word conservists uh, i would say uh, conservationists conservationists thank conservationists, you yeah. um, the, the conservationists um they how emotional they got because they said everything that comes up from the titanic is rusted it's fetid it's rotten it's 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 death it's a death you've never mm-hmm. experienced um, and then he smells the i know the moment yeah, you're about yeah. to describe um, yeah and th- so i can understand in that respect how emotional that 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 would be and, and how people say well because while I was watching the, I know we're not talking about this document, but when I was watching Save the Titanic with Robert Ballard, just as a bit of background research, because um, I hadn't seen it in a few years, I was thinking, but the whole thing's going to crumble. So what are people, it's like, well, what are you trying to, I get what, what he's well, trying his, to do. His argument, I mean, his argument is good, right, that there's a there could be a telepresence, that instead of sending all these subs down or bringing things up, you could just set up a remote viewing camera down there and let the whole world see it, right? Yeah. That's a good argument for now, but this thing is going away, you know, and in, 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 in some people think it might be as few as 20 or 30 years, but this Titanic will disappear. So the ocean is eating Titanic. The ocean is taking Titanic back. And so if we want to, which there is a beauty to that as well. So I also see the argument of just, you know, mother earth swallowing. It's you know, yeah. but if you want pieces of it, which I mean, again, I fall kind of in the middle. I don't really know if I've fully formed my opinion. I do have a very distinct opinion about who should be in charge of these artifacts. I don't think that these this private uh, <laughs> company. Should, I mean, I don't. I'll I'll get a little political on a podcast. I don't care. But I I don't like in the United States. These artifacts are at the Luxor in Las Vegas which is a very, it's not an easy place to access. It's very expensive to access. And, you know, I've never been because I have two small kids and I don't go hang out in Vegas. (laughs) So, you know, I, so I think, um, I think I have some very distinct opinions about who should be in charge of these museums. I think they should be run on a nonprofit basis. Um, So that I would, I have some very, you know, definitive opinions about but in terms of the artifact debate I didn't mind this documentary featuring some artifacts because I do personally appreciate seeing and and hearing about them because they give you that and that's what the companion book to this documentary said it gives you that very personal you start to feel a personal connection to some of the people you know like the people they feature in this documentary when you see objects that like you said, like, oh, that might be the last bowl that this person used, or that might be this person's pocket watch or whatever it may be. So. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, it's a very strange um, line to, to sit, but what I was trying to remember from earlier, uh, we had a little interruption, um, was that if you look at it in terms of if this was a military ship that had gone down with 1500 people or 1500 people or 1500 soldiers it would not i don't know how it works with american shipwrecks but i know british shipwrecks are protected they get they get uh, a blanket thrown not not black like that a metaphorical blanket gets thrown over them and they aren't touched and you don't go and assess them you don't go and video them you don't you can't dive them um because I, oh no you can hear i'm pretty sure you can hear i don't think oh. there's any I don't think there's any regulation oh, the, oh, there's, as far as I know. There's massive for British ships because I, I know. Oh, I work, okay. Um, it, 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 I'm not sure how, I, I'm not entirely great on the specifics of it, but I know if you want, you can't do what was happening with the Titanic. You couldn't go and, gotcha. you couldn't go near okay. them. Um, so, but it is, it is interesting, but um, this documentary, so we, we follow George Tullock, who was the RMS Titanic Inc. president. And we also follow, the what was he oh jack what was the guy's name jack jack eaton jack eaton and we Eaton's, also follow yeah. um so 
did I say George Chuck Lorre? Yes, I did. Um, he was the expedition leader on this documentary. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was it was interesting to to look at that, and so just so this documentary starts to follow different people. Um, we follow as the brick talking about these objects. So they bring up, um, they follow Thomas Andrews in a very traditional with that look. They bring up mm -hmm. uh, Lightoller and a very traditional with that outlook. But they also bring up other stories that we haven't um, that we've never heard before. So the story of um, the Lindells, yes, uh, who was yes. from Sweden. Um, so I've got um, a good bit of background info, info on those. So um, what, did you take any notes about, about those guys? Or? No, I would love to hear if you have more information. The main thing I, I took out of that story is, and I think I mentioned this to you in an email, is that I think there's a myth that we don't have, you know, any sources about second and third class passengers and that's why they're not written about. And that's categorically untrue. Yeah. I mean, it is it is harder for a lot of the passengers. There aren't as many memoirs. There aren't as many public sources as in, I mean, you look at someone like Madeline Astor. Of course, you could write a book about her because <laughs> there's newspaper articles, magazine articles, everybody that knew her in New York society. You could there's sources for days. So there are fewer sources on, say, a third class couple. But I think there's a myth that there aren't any. But I think this documentary actually did a good job of showing that, you know, for that couple that you're about to talk about, the Lindells. I mean, we actually have a fair amount of information, and yeah, so we can feature great. people like that. Yeah, yeah. Great. so yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear more about them. I actually don't yeah. know a ton about oh, no, them I'll, besides well, this. So I'll ch I'll chuck some information uh, at you and at the, at the listeners, uh, hopefully in an eloquent way. But no, it, it is that interesting. I would argue. I know you come up, you you look at things in your podcast from a cultural point of view. Maybe it's because I'm British. No, I'm not British. Maybe it's because I'm English, but British, whatever. Um, I look very much at class because I know there's a completely different between mm -hmm. how America views class or not let's not get into that or the way that britain everything i think i would argue the majority of things in britain come down to class um so i think it's interesting and i think the where that myth comes from is that the inquiries so the american inquiry and the english inquiry uh, british inquiry sorry under lord mersey i think what happens there is and you can see this the perfect example of this is did the ship break in two because the people who were on it towards the end and the very few that survived so your harold brides um, your Lawrence Beasley from second class who say yes it's split in half because the majority mm -hmm. of the people who either would have heard that have been part of it because it happens either as or just after the lights go out we don't know we probably never will the fact that they say it broke in two and then you have the first class and the other upper society who were all on the boats who say no it stayed in one piece and because of the class of the time who do they believe they go with the officers on the boats and they go with the so I think that's the root beginning of the myth or at least I argue so the documentary looks at um Ellen Gerda Lindell who was 30 and her new husband Edvard Bengtsson uh, Lindell sorry if there's any Swedish people listening um I do actually have I do actually have one percent Sweden so if there are anybody out there please um I'd love you to I would, get in touch. I would, butcher, I would butcher the names worse than you. Yeah, so I, I'll I would, let you um, handle that. <laughs> so the, the story is um, the wedding ring of uh, Ellen Gerda Lindell was, was found in collapsible air when it was found um, uh, at sea by the Oceanic. And I might jump around a little bit here. It's only because my, to the listeners and, and to yourself, LA, because um, my notes are kind of in different parts. I was finding different bits of information. Um, this is what I do before I'd write things up, but I haven't typed them up. Um, so the, her wedding ring was found in collapsible air along with um, three bodies. Um, and August Wernström, who was a political, a, a political dissident from Sweden, traveling under his assumed name, he became friendly with these guys because, as you know, uh, well, as you know, earlier, but people might not know, there was no trans. I think I, I've heard, I don't know if it's true, I've, I've heard stories there was one translator for God knows how many, I don't know if that's true, but I, I there was no like multi languages, there was signs, not, no kind of, there was multinational no. crew, there was Italians and the, a lot of multi, but the, there was no kind of nobody there who would help out. Uh, there was no personal address system, no tannoy system. So, mm -hmm. um, why, why did that? Yeah, so if you heard somebody who was speaking Swedish in third class, you'd, of course you'd go and talk to them because you, mm -hmm. you can talk to them. Um, I, I don't know how many multilingual, I'm not multilingual either, but I don't know how many bilingual or multilingual people there were at the time. Um, so anyway, so August Fernstrom, he he's the only one out of the three who survives. 
And he said that um, Edvard, who, who we see in the documentary, they, they portrayed him, he, he froze to death in the, the lifeboat. Um, and Wernstrom um, kept hold of, I'm not sure if it's Wernstrom or Wernestrom, um, he keeps hold of uh, Ellen's uh, in hand. And we don't know if, because I know in the documentary he portrayed the ring coming off in his hand, but I, I'm more inclined mm -hmm. to think it probably fell off. I don't, I don't know. Um, but it was found in the bottom of the boat. It was sent to the Swedish consulate in New York. And then the ring was reunited with her father, uh, her father in Sweden after her brother saw a note in a local newspaper. Um, and it, it's re it remained in the family for years. And um, Gerda's niece, because there was a bit of confusion because I think she was on the passenger list as Ellen Lindell and where she was known oh, as Gerda. Okay. So there was a bit of confu uh, confusion. Um, it remained in the family for years. And then Gerda's niece, um, she it was stored in Sweden for years and then it was started to be brought out for exhibits, which is what we see in the documentary. So Gerda's brother was called Niels Nielsen. He was employed by the Swedish National Railway. He saw the call in the newspaper from the Swedish Office of Foreign Affairs. Uh, he, he commuted between Malmo and Gothenburg. I wonder if it's the Gothenburg where... Oh, no, that's a different person. Uh, Gerda's father was Niels, um, Niels Persson. It's double S, I'm not sure on the pronunciation. He received the ring in Gantuf, uh, Gantorfa, um, as he, as uh, presumably her next of kin. Um, and that was the only thing they got to, that connected them with their lost daughter. Um, she, her body was never found. And I think uh, neither, were, neither was her husband's. Um, and the, the, her death cast a shadow over their, their life. Um, and this was the confusion. So... Um, they were searching for a Mrs. Gerda Lindell, but she was Ellen Lindell on the passenger list. Um, and the letter um, that was, which bit am I talking about now? Yes, sorry, the letter that was sent to, sent to the Swedish Office of Foreign Affairs was sent 7th of June 1912. It was printed on White Star Line stationery, which still had Olympic and Titanic on the letterhead. Um, so that, that was my uh, extra information. Sorry that it was a a lot to go to there, uh, LA, but so that's what I found so far. No, it's great. And I think I, you know, I was actually, I, I was going through, when I went through this companion book, I made notes about the different artifacts that were featured. It's like, it's one of those gloss, you know, glossy kind of coffee table books as we call them over here. But I just was thinking about the ring and I was going through a list of the other artifacts that they feature in the book, but, you know, things like brass buttons from the White Star uniforms, it whistles. And I, I actually was in, um, was in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee this summer, which is where one of the museum attractions is, the Titanic Museum attractions. And they, so the, the company behind those actually align themselves with uh, Robert Ballard, uh, sort of line of thinking and the only artifacts that are in those uh, owned by it's it's two museums one's in Missouri and one's in Tennessee uh, the people that own those only feature artifacts that were either donated by families that were in possession of them or uh, were brought up from uh, in you know in a lifeboat from the actual wreckage that was floating thing like there's a they have a deck chair there but the deck chair was just brought up from the you know wreckage above the surface at the time yeah. in 1912. So uh, I you know so I was thinking about all of this and and some of the artifacts that that I saw there this summer sort of fall into this category too. You know keys that belong to someone that were found on a body or so and so's family was in possession of this ring for a long time and then wanted it to go on display and so sent it out to these museums and and obviously they're probably making money off of that which I think is fine I think if you know if you you know personally I I don't necessarily have a, pro a problem with someone I think you know I see, choosing I see, to this, do it that this way is the so. difference between America and England is so if you donated something to a museum in England you donate it free of charge so you donate it and you bequest it uh, to the museum okay. so you say to the museum right, I want you to keep this. Unless it's on the advent of somebody's death and it's been auctioned, which does happen sometimes, like a family member. Yeah, but and I think that's more what, what happens yeah. in these cases if it is says, auction. Yeah. If it's in this country, I mean, I might be wrong, but I don't know if it's the same in America, but in this country, it'll say underneath, uh, donated to Eden Camp Museum oh, yeah. by kind permission of this family member. And that may, and they'll have agreements where, it'll, and you can bequeath things in your will to museums and it's mm -hmm. kept kind of in trust with the museum. 
but I think it and they do that here as well I mean there is a lot of that here as well but with some of these artifacts I have noticed that some of them either go on loan and it seems to me sometimes there's a fee associated with that like the um the museum in in Pigeon Forge Tennessee has Wallace Hartley's violin which there has been a whole I would need five hours to talk about it but there's a whole thing about is this really his violin I don't know if you've heard about that I so did, and I, I think follow it yeah I think it is. I don't know. So, but they have this and it's insured at, you know, something like $3 million. It just seems to me, I don't, I, I haven't worked in museums very much. I interned at a few museums in grad school. I've sort of, you know, put my toes in the world of the of, of museums a little bit here, you know, in the U.S. where I am, but I don't know a ton about policy. So I can't, you know, I don't want to yeah, speak no, out of turn and get anything wrong, but it does seem to me like, with these private museum attractions there may be some money exchanging hands um i did see we did see the violin my kids were knocking on the the plexiglass there at the time they were four and six and i i just remember thinking if you knock that over yeah. i we will probably go to jail so please calm down <laughs> you know if if you knock over the three million dollar insured wallace hartley violin mommy's going to be in trouble so yeah absolutely stop, i mean but... i think the the only <laughs> place i've seen real um titanic artifacts was in the maritime museum in liverpool uh, where oh, the ship, yeah. was, ship was registered hence why liverpool was on the back of it which confuses a lot of people and who, who know like little bits and mm -hmm. there was a life jacket there i think there was a bed from the olympic and what amazed me was how small they and there was how small they are because people were so much mm -hmm. smart i saw a life jacket and thought there's no way that would fit on me and given that was like oh, a yeah, they're so sat, small, so small. And, and then and people were so much smaller. Yeah. And they had they had some uh, see th these are from the time, but they got stolen, I think, at the Pier 54 in New York. Um they had some of the nameplates, and you know the the little flag that you got that were bolted or screwed onto the lifeboats. They had those there. And I mm -hmm. remember I think they had the nameplates from the back of the from the back of the Mauritania. Uh, they had the massive letters uh, on the wall yeah. and I was like well that's mm -hmm. cool and then when I read underneath it was the actual it was the real ones I was like that's pretty amazing to have so that was yeah it's 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 really inc I mean I that's why I kind of fall in the middle on this camp it's really incredible to see this stuff and and I I know we don't we shouldn't go off on too much of a Ballard tangent again but just to note and I have this I did an episode on Bob Ballard uh, he has brought up artifacts from other wrecks, just to be clear. So he, there is a little, and I'm, I'm not going to say hypocrisy because I don't know the man personally. I'm certainly not going to make a character assessment, but I, but just the historian in me feels the need to note that. And I did in my episode, you know, he has brought up artifacts from um, a lot of ancient shipwrecks. He's, he studied this, um, this sort of trade route line um, in Greece. I was he is in the Baltic. He's been in several locales, but he has been involved in diving some ancient shipwrecks, and he very readily brings up artifacts from those. So do with that information what you will. But I think you know it's a very complex debate with a whole lot of layers. So it's one of those debates where you could tell me you, you fall on either side, and as long as you have you know, an informed opinion, and not you personally, but, you know, metaphorically. <laughs> no, but I didn't know, I didn't I, know that. Yeah. The only, the only, uh, the only um, side that I know of, of Ballard is that I read about, well, I've got books on Britannic, but I know he wasn't involved in that. It's more Simon Mills. But I looked at, um, that when he discovered the Bismarck, um, mm -hmm. and with that being a grave, like, I don't know how the Germans do it. I think they're very similar to the British authorities. Very much you need permission to go down and touch them. You can't remove anything. I did not know. I know he'd done extra extra, uh, extra expeditions, uh, but I didn't know he he'd done that. So I mean, that's that's the interesting thing about about history or uh, debates, whether about anything. If you, uh, so I could stand my ground here. Not, not that I have. We're, we're both very much in the middle. I think I could stand my ground and say, well, I think they're completely right to do this, and you could say no, they're not. But then if you gave me a piece of information as a historian, I, I can go right. Okay, well, I'm gonna because I definitely will go away and give that a read. And I think if if nothing else from mm -hmm. people listening to the podcast, if you're interested, go go away, go away and do a bit of reading, and then like <laughs> yeah, just absolutely. Con I think contact, that's what. Sorry, contact review yourself. I'll contact um, unsinkable uh, podcasts and, and let us know exactly 
where you fall and if we're missing bits of information so because no one's perfect mm -hmm. you can research to the ends of the earth and people will still find something a little extra um oh yeah come back they to will <laughs> <laughs> absolutely no i always encourage and i tell you i've i've gotten i've gotten the vast majority of them are very positive but i without mentioning any names i have received a few emails from titanic people that have some very uh, glued in opinions about how how titanic should be talked about so i but i and i've said this in my podcast i um i actually i don't mind ruffling feathers because i mean my i have academic training in history and this is what you do right the skill set is and you do i know you did a master's in history as well this is what you do like you have to ruffle feathers because you've got to talk about gender race class you there's no point in a historian existing unless they're breaking open things to talk about them in new ways or to investigate things in new ways. In many ways, a historian is very much like a journalist, I think, in that way. And so, you know, I think when you talk about some of these long-standing debates and questions with Titanic, it's you're inherently going to ruffle some feathers. Well, I think but that's it's because people a good think thing. that I mean I know just from listening to me all podcasts, um, we are not completely on the same page on certain things. Um, but that, I mean, I would always probably argue class above all, but maybe that's just because of mm -hmm. the different countries and the different cultures that you get from different oh, countries. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But but, yeah. I, but that wouldn't stop me listening. I wouldn't stop me, like I said to you uh, before about mm -hmm. when I listened to your last podcast, uh, the last podcast that you did with William. Hazelgrove. Oh, thank you. Um, and he, he his was brilliant, but I found myself, and this wasn't a joke when I uh, sent the email, I found myself going, mm, no, well, hang on, what about this? And what about, when I was listening, uh -huh. but that's, that's part of it. It's part of saying, well, look, what, what about that? Yeah. And I love, I love that podcasting on the whole um, is so positive. And I th well, everybody I've met has been positive, but it is a shame that people have those entrenched views. And I mean, I, I would, I mean, I, yeah, if you're going to go look at something, then you've, I mean, I very much look at history in a slightly different way. When I did, uh, when I do my research, I like to look more at memory and how things are remembered, but, and mm -hmm. also how things change through time. So, the way that we might today do an assessment on J. Bruce Isme uh, would be completely different to what happened in, you know, the 30s when he was still, you know, mm -hmm. dad in 36, I think, would be completely yeah, different so. because they had the Depression and they had the, the Roaring Twenties and you had the uh, all these different events that shape our country or how the world, as we've seen over the past few years, how the world can, can see things through a totally different lens. And I like to look at it like that in terms of, I don't tend to break it down into gender, class, that kind of, well, I do class sometimes. Um, and it, But it is an interesting way to look at things. Um, I, I like to look at what, like countries. So why does this country, why does Britain remember this today like this? Mm -hmm. So interesting, but didn't yeah. Didn't remember it like that. That's where the whole bomber command thing came from. Because you can see a historical figure go from being held up as a hero to, you know, 60, 70, 80 years later, people are going, well, no, no, hang on a minute. Um, th th this isn't somebody we should be revering. But as you've mm -hmm. shown with just the Titanic, um, when p you start arguing certain points, or uh, not arguing, like, well, no, you are arguing, but you, you're you arguing a point. Professionally yeah, arguing. Yeah. Um, people aren't a massive fan of that. But then I would always say, well, if I disagreed with somebody, I'd like to go, okay, like I do in my personal life or at work, I'd say, well, I don't agree with you, but I'm not just telling you that I think that you're wrong. All I'm I'm just saying this is my opinion, but I will give you some reasons why. Um, and I think as long as people do that, then you can. You yeah, know, an informed opinion. Yeah, if yeah, you, if that's, I, I never fault anyone for having an opinion if they can tell me why. You know, and that's why I, in every single episode, and I, the one you, if you listen to the Hazel Grove episode, I, I mentioned, I said I know what we say about Walter Lord for and for listeners. He wrote a book called A Night to Remember that is this, you know, huge cultural important Titanic book. I knew that that interview in terms of that might ruffle some feathers. So I did a little intro, mentioned that, made sure everybody knew it wasn't out of malice, but I asked for feedback. I mean, that every single episode I ever do, every film review I've ever done on the pod, I ask for feedback because I, I and it's not just a, you know, throwaway line. I really want it. And I've received, I mean, every week I receive, you know, five or 10 really good emails from people just all over the world that just want to throw in an opinion on something that I've covered. And that's the whole point of all of this. It's so. amazing, isn't it? How, how wide the spread of this, of this ship goes and, and that, that people can be brought together through a shared interest. I told you about 
Um, and it's true, when I did a half marathon and I, in this crowd of like a thousand people, managed to bump into this, this uh, last the same age as me, who loved the Titanic. So for 10 miles, we ran beside each other and just- Oh yeah, that would be all. a I mean, miracle. Yeah, it was. It would, time would just go by like easiest, that. Easiest, yeah. one I've, easiest one I've ever done, mm-hmm. honestly. Uh, but like you were saying earlier about about the second class um, uh, passengers, we've got Lawrence Beasley who, who wrote a book. He was actually the technical advisor, I'm sure you know, but for the listeners, uh, um, yeah. So for the for the listeners, um, Lawrence Beasley, he was a technical advisor on a night to remember. And when they filmed the scenes of the ship sinking, he jumped on set to kind of ceremoniously go down with the ship, if you will. Um, but he was called because of union rules. No, I'm sorry, we're not allowed. Because mm-hmm. everybody has to be insured and all that kind of thing, um, and it was—it's interesting. They have you have Lightoller in it, who was mm-hmm. one of the first people through the inquiries. I mean, good God, if we were going to talk about the inquiries, we'd be here five hours. Because I, oh, anyway, and that would—I know that would. Probably oh, you be- might, yeah, you might lose some listeners at that point because they would be like, "What? Where is the movie in this?" Yeah, no, that's a. <laughs> but if oh, yeah, I don't, I'm I not could, worried about that. Don't worry. <laughs> I could definitely. Uh, I can. I I read every word of them, and it took me. A long time yeah but yeah it's but a I lot love, but i love yeah. it and then so but lightall <laughs> has been but it went on record as saying later in his life that well he first said um that he did he didn't at the time want to implicate the board of trade or the white star line and you've got to remember that this is a different time it, completely so especially and this is shown in the documentary where the postal workers died trying to yes, save, that was a, trying that was to a save, great part yeah trying to mm-hmm. save the the mailbags and just to bring it back to films, James Cameron um, mentioned, I mean, he did his research, that guy, whatever you think of the film, he did his research. So we also have a part that the ice, so this documentary makes a point of the ice warnings um, came from the Nordam, the Coronia, the Baltic, the America, the Californian. And Cameron in the film actually when I don't know if it's a deleted, deleted scene or if it's still in the film, I think it's still in where Rose and her mom are, uh, are talking to Captain Smith. And he says, oh, not to worry. This come up, oh, yeah. Brad comes up to him and says, um, this one, another ice one in this one's from the Nordam. So he did his research. Oh, yeah. And because this documentary makes the point that this message from the Masaba, um, that was an Atlantic transport line ship, um, that it that message that Phillips didn't pass onto the bridge um at nine at 9 30 um on the night of the 14th. So a couple of hours before they hit the iceberg, almost to the to the uh, to the to the minute. Uh, that would like all. was one of the first people to bring that up and say that that was the one of the sole reason. Now I'm always dubious of saying anything happens for a sole reason because it, it doesn't. Um, so that was an interesting point the documentary tried to make. Yeah, I <laughs> and it's funny that you mentioned the interview I just did. I I did on my pod an interview with William Hazelgrove who wrote a book called 160 Minutes and it's about the wireless operations. It's about the wireless operators and then this kind of rescue mission of all the ships that received the call. And anyway, that the episode is there, obviously, if anyone wants to go look at it. But something that I really learned from talking to him and and I've been researching the wireless a little bit is I when I saw that in the documentary, I I was just I was in my living room like folding clothes (laughs) and just shouted out, oh, I I just I got really angry because I'm like you, I as a historian, it's uh (laughs) To say that something happens because of one small reason yeah. is a very dangerous claim to make, number one, but also because um, that's just hogwash, I, as as we say here in the American South. Um, so basically, the there were, I think there were something like 13 ice warnings that came in that day. So Captain Smith, Bruce Ismay, all the officers, they're well aware that there are ice, there's ice. They know yeah. that they're in the ice field and way you, before the Masaba message would have come oh, in. Absolutely. Captain Smith has already diverted the ship south yeah. to try to miss some of the ice. So this idea that this yeah. one warning, if it had come up, it just, it, yeah. to me, it's a pretty ridiculous and claim. Again, yeah. to go back to myths, this whole thing about while they were speeding through the ice, how irresponsible. No, the accepted thing at the time was, unless you stopped for ice, which ships did I mean the Californian, which they had communicated with earlier in the day, mm-hmm. told Jack Phillips and Harold Brad, we've stopped, told the ship, we have stopped for ice. Uh, well, you can argue where, I mean, you got that, that's another episode we need to do. You can argue where you think the Californian was and whether it was the ship yep. that was seen and there's some deleted scenes in the James Cameron film. Cameron it's, shot uh, some of that. Oh yeah, he yeah. did, yeah. There's some good scenes as well, but I mean, how long can a film be? Um, 
but anyway, so the actual message came through at 9.30 p.m. on the 14th of April. So the actual message was SS Masava to RMS Titanic. They did these, uh, they had certain codes for that. I think Titanic was, what was Titanic's? Oh, I should know that off the top of my head. Oh, I should know it. I, can, oh, I never M can remember MSG. it. Is it MSG? MSG. 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 It's MSG. Yeah. I always um, think of message, like on a, yeah. like an eye message. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so SS Masaba to RMS Titanic and all eastbound ships, ice report in latitude 40, 42 degrees north to 41.25 degrees north, longitude 49 degrees west to 50.3 degrees west. Uh, saw much heavy pack ice and great number of large icebergs, also field ice. Weather good, clear. Titanic to Masaba received thanks. That was 9.35 p.m. So five minutes later. Um, and it's interesting though that you go back to Light All so uh, well, I'm going back to it, sorry. The 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 fact that he they're publishing the bridge version of Light Aller's book in the Dundee Evening Standard in 1936. Now it got two complaints, published complaints. One of these was interestingly from Harold Bride the wireless, junior wireless operator. Mm -hmm. And he said, basically, he argued Jack Phillips would have been the first uh, dis to disclaim having done anything spectacular or heroic. But this car, but his this calm efficiency resulted in the survivors being safely landed in New York. Such efficiency does not go with putting urgent ice warnings under paperweights and promptly forgetting them. So this is, and also it's what gets forgotten. And it was done in a fantastic amateur film um that it's on youtube and i cannot remember what it's called it's called last warnings or last call i'll, I'll find a link for it um, and if you haven't seen it la please go and watch it it's okay it, yeah it's a whole see it's a whole movie i don't know how long it is not a full length um and it follows jack bride and uh jack phillips played by actors and it just has the whole story i mean for example the night before the wireless set completely broke and the rules, yes. were, the rules were at the time, because they were employed by McCorney, not by the White Star Line, was mm -hmm. if the equipment breaks, because it was so new, don't touch it, leave it broken, and we will we will we will fix it, leave it for the engineers, leave it for the leave it for our official because it was such new technology. Now they spent all night, and this is also, I would argue, the reason why Jack Phillips probably doesn't survive when Harold Bride does uh, or part of it is he's so exhausted because they both spend the whole night mm -hmm. fixing this piece of equipment so whether or not he put the message on a spike or it didn't get you know delivered to the captain because they were doing all these messages um, what him and Harold Bride did that night was was I mean you throw a heroic around but if they hadn't have fixed that equipment the night before this whole point would have been moved the, the ice the, the, the lifeboats the whole lot the lifeboat oh, everybody in the lifeboats would have died. Yeah. Nobody would have ever known what happened to Titanic because even the survivors in the lifeboats would have died. We would have never. We would be. We would be saying that aliens took the ship. Like my guest on my well, pod the other day said, yeah. we would just be saying, "Who knows what happened? Maybe yeah. a, a Bermuda Triangle type thing yeah. opened it up." I mean, become a Mary Celeste type thing. Would except they didn't find exactly. it. Exactly. It would have gone. It would down like that. I think. Yeah, you would see podcasts now that would be titled, you know, what happened to Titanic? Where I mean, I can't tell you how many history podcasts have done an episode on the Mary Celeste. And I'm thinking, there's enough. Go, go find another shipwreck. There's like enough podcasts on this. Um, so yeah, I think I think that with the wireless to operators. To be fair though, LA, to be fair to the to the not that I'm just devil's advocate. To be fair, not that I've looked for them, but to be fair to the Mary Celeste people, right? Those podcasters, <laughs> they are no doubt, because I know people have said this to me. Oh God, can you please read another book? Like, can you put like read about something else? There's loads of other ships. And I have, I've dipped into Olympic and Britannic with Mark Churnside and his series of books and yeah. Simon Mills of Brit Britannic, but I don't know something about Titanic, but to be fair to them, they're probably saying the exact same thing. Like, oh, oh yeah, Titanic no, people. I realized it as soon as I said it. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, they probably, yeah, I know a lot of people probably are, you know, see a podcast like mine and their thought is, what about the other, you know, 75 significant shipwrecks over the past 200 years that where people have lost lives or whatever it may be? Um, I actually, I'm actually working on, I'm going to do a couple of side episodes throughout the year on some other shipwrecks um, that are a little bit lesser known 
and need, I think, a little bit of attention because they're not the ones that you, you know, might open up your, you know, typical history podcast and see an episode on. So I'm hoping to do a little bit of that, you know, by cracking open. Um, because when I did the Robert Ballard episode, I really started to get interested in the di- the diving process of diving shipwrecks and why people do this and who's doing this. So that sort of opened up the dialogue in my head. So maybe yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, um, not be a hypocrite and do a little bit of that. Myself. Well, I, definitely <laughs> but, uh, to, I definitely, I mean, I think it's an easy segue and feel free to take the idea. Um, I think I'd recommend uh, exploring the Britannic Simon Mills. I got it for my birthday last year. Well, my family, my brothers and sisters gave me a card for books and said, buy what you want. So I bought Britannic by Simon yeah. Mills. And that does have a lot in it about diving. Because okay. when I started reading it, I was like, God, this is a lot about diving. But because it's so dangerous, there has been deaths, unfortunately, of divers mm-hmm. on the Britannic. Uh, but also how interesting that that shipwreck has become not like the Titanic. I mean, Titanic's full of biological life forms. That's what the rusticles are. Um, I can't remember the Latin name of it. Um, uh, but the, the Britannic's become this kind of almost tropical reef. And it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. I think the Titanic an argument of just the only argument I would give to people who would say, well, what about another ship? I'd say, well, it's such, and this is where me and um, I loved in your last podcast, uh, I agreed wholeheartedly with William that it's a microcosm of the society at that time. And it's frozen mm-hmm. in time. So you can always, you can always go back to it and, and you know, and th- that's where the whole class thing comes into it um, and use it as a metaphor and analogy for I mean oh, almost anything when it comes to class and I would tell I mean my in terms of you know your podcast being a film podcast I my number one recommendation as someone who is a historian but is also just a I'm also just a movie person and I love documentaries and is my thing would be if you watch this documentary you know whether you agree with whatever side you are on the artifact debate or whatever just use this as an opportunity to jump into some of these other titanic and shipwreck documentaries because there are a ton of them yeah. this over is, the last yeah. 20 or 30 years and they're all really interesting yeah to, sorry you know, no, kind of, you're right it is a per- and also i would say it is sorry to interrupt i'm one of these people who don't get it out it'll go it is a perfect um documentary it's a perfect starter documentary it's a real beginner mm-hmm. level like, there are some things in it as a titanic historian and i'm surprised we have, we've got this far into it without mentioning it they say all oh, the 16 lifeboats I'm like yes and four collapsables but they yeah they don't um, i know funny. i was it's, just shouting it's but, nothing yeah, I, yeah exactly <laughs> it's yeah. a little bit old-fashioned though isn't it? the effects aren't great and it is very it does a very simple outline of of, of the story for you in terms of how the ship went down but as just something to start off with, just a very easy 45, 50 odd minutes to if watch. You're just, yeah, if you want to get into Titanic a little bit, if you're someone that's always been curious about, you know, maybe you like the movie and you've seen a, a Night to Remember too, and you've always wanted to know more of kind of the real quote unquote, you know, if you're someone that, because the thing is like, I, I lose sight, I'm guilty of losing sight of this sometimes. It's such a big part of my life, especially right now that, I forget it's not a big part of most people's lives and they just, most people just know the basics, you know? Yeah. So I think any of these documentaries that you watch are probably going to get you more than, you know, because if you're just yeah. someone that knows the basics, then maybe watching this one, you know, I mean, obviously we're nitpicking it a little bit, but if you're <laughs> someone that doesn't know much about Titanic, then you're probably going to have a great time watching this because you're learning things you didn't know. So yeah, it's, absolutely. you know, absolutely. yeah, so absolutely. it's kind of a double-edged sword, but. Yeah, it is. And I, it's, I mean, talking about how you, you talk to just general people that you work with or you meet uh, through your work um, or why the family and friends when you say, I always say to people and I'd, I'd love to know, I really would love to know how you explain it. So I'll give you how I explain it. So if I'd met you, I'd say, oh, hello, Elliot. And you'd say, oh, if you got anything, you know, people say, oh, what's your mastermind subject? What would your specialist subject be? And I go, the Titanic, the actual ship, not the film. That's how I describe. Yeah. Describe it. How, how do you describe it when you explain it to people? Like you um, don't know your podcast and things. I describe it as the cultural history of Titanic and how it pervade, how it is pervasive in cultural memory. Like what obsesses me is how pervasive it is in the cultural mind. How, how much, and to me, the movie is married to that. And I was 13 when the movie came out. So I was a, a Titanic head and a Leo head and a, you know, and I still am. And so to me, it's all married together and I can't separate that. It's a cult to me, it's the cultural history of all of that together. And, you know, I, I just, if anyone ever asks, I always give examples like 
perfect example. I'm walk, I'm watching a kid's movie with my kids last night, the new Disney movie Encanto, and which is the songs were written by Lin-Manuel Miranda. It's a fantastic movie, but there's a song and in the little music video of the song within the movie, Titanic, just suddenly the character is like fantasizing yeah. that they're on Titanic. Oh, I've got, I've it got, never goes yeah, away. No, I've got ever. one for you. I've got one for you. Now for the Americans listening, you call it Axe, A-X-E, but over here we call it Lynx, the body spray, the deodorant. They did oh, an yeah. advert. Do you remember the advert with the guy? One, uh, I don't know if it went out in America. Apologies if it didn't, and I will send you. Yeah, a... I didn't see that. Okay, well, it was. Oh, it might be like ten years ago, but it came out, and the whole thing was one is the loneliest number. And it was one guy spraying himself in a shot, trying to get to this is like dream girl. But it went through all these different parts, so it went through like um, a, a, the, an old war, the First World War. Uh, no, before the first of all, it went through. He was going down a corridor, and it's that's flooding, and he's got the jacket on. And it's very clearly the Titanic. And then there's then there's another, and he's trying to get to her, and the wave knocks him over. And then there's another part where, and it sounds dead flippant, but it was actually, I thought quite well done. You, you but you knew exactly what it was, um, and it went through all these different things. It went to he, the swing in sixties, and he's trying to get to her, and then he gets like he's a, he gets carted off by police, and then there's another bit. And it's all these little clips put together, but they're very recognisable as these historical touchstone, you know, first of all, it's the touchstone. It's it's the touchstone for the very beginning of the 20th century. There is no other event besides World War One that is as much of a touchstone as that sort of, you know, journey into or I guess like angry, you know, sort of collapse into modernity. Um, and violence at and least they didn't, at least political the, upheaval at least the documentary you are right sorry but just, at least the documentary didn't call it victorian because i've heard people say that when i and i'm like no it's edwardian yeah. it's edwardian but edwardian <laughs> it's very different it's quite different uh and also the my one other nitpick is that the documentary uh <laughs> at the beginning there is a voiceover that you know the, the sub dives are so dangerous and here this historian goes down and you know one tiny razor's edge of a hole on the sub and they'll all explode and die and I mean that is true it is true that if one tiny microscopic hole is in that sub they're gonna they're gonna go but I just thought it was sort of some fake drama because those subs are extremely safe I've researched quite a bit of it because of Ballard and then right now I'm really researching James Cameron a lot and they're so safe the number of incidents there have been is microscopic so it's I thought that was a little bit of just you know drama uh making in terms of the documentary Maybe. I don't yeah I mean it is I'm sure very nerve-wracking to go down mm. in those subs well, if you do are, everything don't they because I, I watched the I, documentary with and I don't know if you've heard of him you might not have uh, but Sir Tony Robinson, he did Time Team and he's done a lot of documentaries. I know who he is. Yeah, yeah he went I like down him. And, yeah, yeah, he's great, isn't he? He went down and did um, a dive with Cameron, which if you haven't seen that documentary, that's an interesting one. Because Yeah, yeah, I didn't know this. Yeah, honestly. You just told me something I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I've, I'm, the episode on Cameron is coming out next Monday and I'm about, my husband has said that I, Basically, I sort of said, yeah, I guess I'm starting a James Cameron cult. That's sort of what my life looks like right now. I'm, I'm reading and watching so much about him, but I didn't know about this. So, yeah, I'm so Tony look that Robinson, up. Yeah. I don't know if it was for 2012 or around there. I think it is definitely it's a few years ago because Tony Robinson okay. was a bit younger on it. But um, airplane, I think. Sorry. Um, I was thinking, what's that? Noise? Um, there's definitely the, the, he does that because uh, they were talking about the will and everything like that. And. Um, and it, it was amazing because I I found it quite because Tony Robinson went I mean you'll know but went for people who don't know Sir Tony Robinson Tony Robinson he does documentaries you'll know him as Baldrick in Blackadder um, he's done a few other things as well but he's done history documentaries for years Earth was that nice I think is it sorry there must be military aircraft going over which is very rare for here but if, uh, sorry yeah um, so he does history documentaries and um, it was interesting when he did it because. He talks about having, and he's very, very candid. So he just says it as it is. He's not, um, he's not brash or vulgar, but he very much. He was talking about all the tablets they have to take. So they take a tablet that stops them needing to go to the toilet. They take a bottle in case they need to go to the other toilet because mm-hmm. there's, there's nowhere, there's nowhere to go. They talk about. Oh no, you're yeah, you're a, stuck. Yeah, there's yeah. a scene where I think he, I don't know if he talked to James Cameron, um, because he, he goes in the sub with James Cameron and somebody else, and there's a bit where they're talking about. Um, something about right we don't take shoes uh, make sure your feet are clean and all because you're spending 
I mean, what, how many? What does it take? Four hours to drop or something? Like that? I can't remember. Uh, it to, ti- to Titanic, it's a 10 hour round trip. Yeah. So five hours, sorry. Yeah. You're, yeah. So you're going to be in there with, I mean, there's that scene in Ghost of the Abyss where Bill Paxton just finally is like, okay, I guess I'm going to have to pee in front of somebody. And they give him yeah. the bottle, you know, and he's been trying to hold it basically. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I just thought it was, it was, to me, it had that very, some of this is just, it had that 90s feel of that very oh, absolutely. 90s sus- yeah, absolutely. suspense building of the, if one, you know, if, if a rock hits that, whatever, you know, they're all going to die if one bit of pressure is unbalanced, I mean, in the sub, wa- which that, is true. That but. was a worry. I know that. I mean, I think even at the, in the night, maybe 90, maybe if it was 94, 90, whenever it was 93, 94, 96, whichever one it was. Um, it, I, th- I don't think the technology had come as I mean, I might be wrong because you're the uh, you're the uh, you're the person researching it. Um, but I think it was still a little bit. I mean, I thought it was still a bit dangerous because the um, they were very worried. I know when they first found the ship that they would they would hit it or scrape it or there's even that documentary where Cameron loses two of his uh, ROVs. The little is it Snoop? S- not Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dog. I uh, know. Um, um, Jake and Elwood. Yes, Jake and yeah, Elwood. That's right. Yeah, yeah the Blues, Blues Brothers. brothers. Yeah. Um, no, that... he doesn't. He, Cameron has a very. He does have one really scary experience when he goes down in '95 on the Keldish. He goes down with the Russian, so he's not going down on this French ship. He goes down on the Russian ship. But uh, yeah, I mean, he has a close call where they sort of there's a little bit of a dust essentially a dust storm down there because there's weather obviously at the bottom of the ocean it's all you can barely see at some points and they almost land (laughs) pretty much almost smacking into the wall I mean so James Cameron there's there is an alternate universe where he his body became part of the wreck of Titanic too because if they had if they had slammed into they were just inches away um, so, you know, incidents are possible, but just for the most part, I mean, I think, I, you know, there haven't been, there haven't been a ton of accidents. I mean, this technology is, is monitored very closely. These teams that run these subs, um, they're testing equipment well, they daily. Cost, they're, it you know, it's thousands, doesn't it? And can you imagine, I mean, I can't even begin to imagine um, the amount of insurances there must be. I mean, purely to send oh, James Cameron yeah, down there. I mean, I know he's, he's got a lot of money, but I mean, purely just, just for Oh, that you alone. probably have to just sign away all of your right. You know, you probably oh, sign away I would guess, absolutely. Abs- I would, I know nothing about it. So this is just conjecture, but I would imagine you have to sign a waiver that basically says I might die today and you can't like my, you know, my family members cannot sue you I've, I've for signed, that. I, you know? I signed but, one of those once. I did a swim. Uh, I do open water swimming, so rivers and lakes. I did oh, one yeah. in, in an outdoor Lido. Um, which is like a big 50 meter swimming pool and it was january the 6th or something uh so the pool was like three degrees uh celsius and they made there was a big yellow metal almost like a road sign that said the temperature is at three point and then they'd wrote in 3.7 degrees it says if you go in this water you are at risk of death heart attack this that and the other and you you had to actually when you signed up you ticked the box you ticked the box to say i understand the risks uh because you can go into cold water shop. yeah so that, that's my only, and I will say that they did it very well in terms of in the film where she's kind of, I know, back to films, I can't help myself, where, where Kate Winslet's very much um, screaming at the end because uh, trivia about the film, when Rose goes back to save Jack when he's chained up in the uh, Master at Arms office and she she takes her jacket off and dips into the water, when she, when she kind of screams or goes... She makes that noise. That was real because the water was really, really cold. Mm-hmm. So, and she does a really good job at the end of replicating that because I can say when your face hits water that's that cold, you lose your breath. Your body starts doing things independent of of your your mind, and you've got to kind of calm mm-hmm. yourself. That so, I, I like that. I, well, I don't like it, but it's very realistic. The James Cameron part at the end where the people are in such distress because I can imagine to be plunged into water that cold because it was supposed to be what just below freezing or, or about it was like point. two it was two yeah like a two degrees below yeah. freezing I think by Cameron the, said it, he'd, he'd overdone the effects with all the ice I think he said he he admitted that he think he thinks they overdid it a little bit and he doesn't think it would okay. have frozen on people but there are accounts in the time that people like the Lindells that that the when uh Vernestrom says the that, survivor yeah, yeah he was holding the wife's hand in the water but didn't have the strength to lift him up and then he only realized afterwards that he was sat there dead. He, he didn't, you know. So, mm-hmm. I mean, there are some parts of the documentary that are quite chilling, I thought. Outside oh, of yeah, the no, it's. Yeah, there, I mean, there's all, I mean, that's, you know, almost, it's like a 20, 
four years old. So anytime you, I mean, documentaries are something that necessarily just age differently than regular films because you are going to see, you know, the dated, you know, clothing or settings that people are recording their interviews in, or you're going to see, you're going to hear dated music because doc, you know, documentaries just don't typically age very well. So that's just kind of inherent in their aesthetics. But I do think if you're someone who um, wants to sort of dip into learning a little bit about this kind of side of Titanic, it's a good one to, I mean, obviously, since it's so readily available too, as well now. So it's good yeah. to just, no, you know, cool. kind of jump in and watch it. It's accessible. Yeah. No, I had fun. I had never, I'd never seen that one. So oh, there you go. I mean, that me. is one yeah. of the first ones I think I ever watched. Um, as, and it's, I think it's one of those ones that's good for a kid that's interested in oh, yeah. the Titanic. Oh, yeah. Um, because I don't think there's any, there's no kind of gore in it. There's nothing graphic in it. Um, I mean, the parents want to listen to it first because there's definitely, you know, there's like descriptions of people passing away, but I don't think there's anything that would, in fact, I, I mean, I know that they give exemptions over here for, for documentaries on the most part, but it would be something that a, a kid could watch. Um, and you can oh, yeah, you know, watch it. Yeah, like a 10 year, um, I mean, eight yeah, or 10 yeah, year old yeah, yeah, and above. Eight, yeah. I mean, that absolutely. kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but that, yeah. I mean, that's on the parents, I suppose. But yeah, so it, it's a, it was a good one. I'm, I'm glad I picked one that you'd, you'd never seen. So I'm quite proud of never myself. Never seen for that. it. I, um, I'm always, I'm always cataloging these in my brain and I have uh, notebooks, stacking on notebooks of all, you know, so, but it's, it's always just an ongoing process for me so I was kind of fun to watch one that did I've never you, seen before do, do you have a copy of the book because I know the book that I recommended to you um was done I think it was the Southampton University Press hang on a minute I've got a copy of it here so it's Titanic Voices Memories from the Fatal I, Voyage it's on my <laughs> My to be read pile is pretty big, but I do. I it is on my radar and in the pile. I have to my pile constantly um, kind of morphs as I you know it's like some things end up taking priority if I happen to be like talking to that author that week or you know so it's a constant rotation. Yeah. But that that actually had another I had a listener email me about that one recently too. Yeah. So I mean, it's it definitely high on my list. Published yeah. in 1994 by um, the Southampton City Council. So it's very focused because Southampton, like Belfast, um, as, as, as city, well, I think they're both cities, um, they lost a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. It was one of those. More than of, anybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. But just because yeah. of uh, the, the logistics of it. But um, yeah, I, sorry, I know we've gone over a little bit on the time, but thank oh, you. No worries. Um, thank you again. For, I could talk all day. So I'm trying to oh, I know. be, be I well behaved. To... <laughs> but I know yeah, you've got to get yourself can... going. No, that's great. I, I, like I told you in, in, in our email exchange, I have the unique situation of trying to balance all of this with um, small kids get home in the middle of the afternoon. So I, this is inside podcast, but a lot of times when you hear me, I'm, you know, sleep deprived because I'm trying to fit all this in while also having, and it's COVID. So we're, you know, they go to school under these like COVID protocol, but we don't really do anything else right now. We're pretty much on lockdown and stuff for that. So, um, but no, this has been fun. I, you know, doing the podcast, I've met people all over the world and it's really kind of incredible that we can just jump on the computer and do this. Yeah. It's amazing. So, well, yeah. It's, it's, and, it's amazing. And I've, I've, I've loved, I've loved talking. Um, Absolutely. Me shocking, too. Shockingly so for a podcaster, but uh, yeah, I've, been, I've, uh, I've loved talking about it. And yeah, I would just say that this is a great documentary to, to, to jump to. Um, but yeah, go over and check out LA's podcast. So it's unsinkable, the Titanic podcast, go over yep. there and have a listen to it. Um, it's quite political, but give it, give it a little, I mean, not that that would put anybody off, but I've oh, no, but it is. To, I don't, no, yeah, it is. The only reason I bring it up is because <laughs> I've listened to other Titanic podcasts because there seems to be a few that have stopped now and things. And a lot of, of quite a few of them are very kind of straight laced and very kind of like the ship did this and then this happened and then this, but yeah, and they are interesting. Very formal, which wrong, there is very merit, formal. there is oh, yeah. merit to that. Of course, yeah, is, yeah, absolutely. But, but you yeah. take a much more, like you've explained before, a more political take on it, which I would definitely, um, I would definitely go, go and have a listen to it. If you're not, massively politically minded because uh, i don't know who listens to my podcasts and you know you're just here for films and i i try even though i'm quite a political person i try to stay away from that stuff go and listen to la's stuff you can tell just listen to it and i can she knows her stuff she really really does oh, thank you um, i'm just, I'm just <laughs> happy you. i'm happy that um that i've managed to keep pace to be honest because it's I'm one oh. of those people who was very, yeah. very kind of obsessed with it as a kid and read up about it. And I've got tons and tons of books and um, I've got family, like my mum my always says about me, you know, 
what Sean doesn't know about the Titanic, you could write on the back of a postcard. Um, and That's what people I, say I, about I started, me, yeah, essentially. Too. <laughs> but, yeah, but I think it's true for you. When I started listening to yours, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to. And when you started talking about Eye from Air, it's been years since I've read of that stuff because, you know, historians have different things to look at. You know, you've had uh, Walter Lord was very much for the survivors and the survivor testimony, whereas other historians mm-hmm. have been very much, Charles Haas did a book with somebody else. Um, he very much was looking looked at expeditions and finding the ship ballads straddled a few different lines as well that's a um, whole different yeah it's um, it's a there there are i mean people ask me all the time if i'm going to run out of episode ideas literally no. i could never and it's you know, once I started doing this more uh, definitively and and I'd always been a Titanic person, but once this became essentially what I do most days, there's there's stuff I don't know. There's every day I learn new things. Every day I open up another corner and I realize, oh, okay. And you know, when I do the film episodes, I've done, like I mentioned some episodes on the Titanic movies, then I get into this whole nother, whole other corridor of Titanic, you know, film history and then just film history and I go off on these tangents about which is fun you know which is why it's fun to do this podcast because I do like I mentioned at the the beginning I am very much interested in film history as well so um yeah no it's great for a lot of people it's a jumping off it's a jumping off point isn't it um just just as the last point for me because I know you've you've got to get on but the the 1997 film that was the jumping on point for me I, I mean I was what five or six when that came out um, and I don't know how old I was when it came out on video, but I watched that video so many times and that, that was my jumping on point um, for mm-hmm. the Titanic. And then I went back and uh, you get into the books and you get into the films and you, you, you know, there's, there's that many a, films It's like there. a gateway drug. Exactly. <laughs> and then you, and, yeah. at, at a certain point, I want to go back. So keep tuned, my listeners, um, although you'll probably get my views on this, but um, my listeners, I'm going to jump back and watch the 1943 Nazi propaganda film that they used clips of in a oh. night to remember. So I'm going to go back and watch that one. So I think it's gone onto the internet as kind of, um, I can't remember what they call it, when it, the publication rights of the public domain. Oh, lapsed. Yeah. When they've lapsed. Yeah. And then I think you it's can, got, yeah. public domain. That's public domain. Yeah. I will definitely be looking out for that episode. I haven't tackled any of that yet it's a you know I haven't opened up that can of worms yet so I'll be interested to I'll be interested to hear what you have to say but um but yeah no this is fun I love talking about movies and any kind of filmmaking and um yeah maybe we can you know maybe later in the year we can find another one you know like the blood and steel or something and and jump on I'd absolutely um that would be fun yeah Um, this is fantastic fantastic. thank you thank thank you so much well thank you for coming on I honestly I really appreciate it especially with the time difference and the way but your kids and your husband huh. bless him um no so, <laughs> yeah blah i mean he's he's very tolerant so <laughs> shout out him um yeah, he knows hope, more yeah. he knows more about titanic than any other software engineer in all of the united states i'm sure so <laughs> um there you go um That's but yeah cool. have a lovely i know it's evening for you have a lovely evening but this was fantastic and thank you for having me on i, no, I think no it's problem. good to cross pollinate and you know uh hopefully some listeners on your podcast might be interested in jumping over and taking a listen to one of my episodes so that's great yeah fantastic uh thank you thank you once again for coming on um you can i'll i'll put some links in um i'll have to learn how to do that but i'll put some links in and go over and check out la's podcast it it really is brilliant if you like titanic or if you want to jump over there just as a film fan she's done some episodes i haven't done yet she's done the 1953 i haven't listened to it myself because i don't like to listen to them because i don't want to kind of copy if you know although you talk about this similar things uh, but yeah, go on over there. But thank you, Ella, for coming on. Honestly, I've, I've, I've absolutely, um, absolutely. So, but, thank uh, you. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>